All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I think we should start with introductions. Um, we have a member of the public here. Um, Migdalia, do you want to just say a few words about your being here or anything you want to tell us? And then I think we'll go around and introduce ourselves. It's just, wow. just very briefly. I'm just really interested in what has to be said regarding uh, affordable housing, what's going on in, uh, in Northampton. And my name is Migdalia Camacho and I was told about this uh, meeting. So I thought I'd just uh, partake in it uh, this evening. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, let's introduce ourselves. I'm, I'm Carmen Juno. I've had a little bit of contact with you. I know Migdalia over the past year and I'm the chair of the partnership. I've been on the partnership for about four years now. Um, Hannah? Uh, I'm Hannah Schaefer and I'm a renter in Florence. Been on the partnership for uh, two, two-ish years now. Gordon? Hi, I'm Gordon. Uh, I'm the vice chair of the partnership. I'm an attorney at Legal Aid here in Western Mass, Community Legal Aid. And I've been on the partnership, I think now it's about 12 years. Um, Edgardo? Uh, hola, Migdalia. Me llamo Edgardo Cancel. I've been on the partnership for probably about five or six years. I'm a renter in Florence. Uh, a uh, former um, public housing uh, tenant, and I'm also on the uh, uh, board of commissioners of the housing, uh, Northampton Housing Authority. Richard. Yes, my name is Richard Abusa. I'm a Florence resident. I uh, have been on the partnership uh, since it started probably 30 some years ago, and uh, I'm a local property manager. Bev. Hola, Migdalia. That's the extent of my Spanish. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, actually, it's not, but we'll save that for later. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I've been on, I, I don't know, I think less than a year. Uh, so you and I are the closest things we have to newcomers. And uh, very, very nice to meet you. Um, my past is all about housing, so it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be on this committee. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, there are several people not here. I'm not sure, Keith, did you hear from anybody besides Sarah? I did not. Okay, so I just want to let everybody know that Sarah has resigned from the housing partnership. So we're down to eight people um, with a couple of people not here, and I haven't heard from them. Fortunately, we have quorum, so the show will go on. Let's move to approval of the minutes. Keith, you had written approval of minutes from November 7th, 2022, but I think we're talking about approval of minutes from February, 2023. That is correct. Right, okay. Um, well, does anybody have any comments, corrections, or want to present a motion to approve them? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor. Edgardo. Yes. Bev. Yes. Bob. Gordon. Yes. Hannah. Yes. Richard. Yes. Me. Yes. Okay. Minutes have been approved from February. All right. Um, Keith, this is your this is your agenda item. I mean, it's all of our agenda items, but um, you are on for update on Chapman Municipal Engagement Light Program award and um yeah we want to hear more about it yes so um i applied and we did get uh, accepted into the program so it's uh technical assistance there's no money involved um but it's uh the the project is focused around the crafts avenue um housing for the homeless um it doesn't have like a technical name yet but it will be our, the city sold a portion of the parking lot of City Hall and down by where the building inspector parks, uh, where those stairs are um, to Valley CDC. And they'll be doing some housing first for homeless. Um, so we 
Yeah, we want this to be an engagement. Um, and I've identified most. So we, you know, we have our um, stakeholders, like the 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 world of people that we want to engage with, you know, business owners that are right there and housing advocates and uh, homeless advocates, things like this. That's like the big universe of people who want to end up. Um, but we want a core group of five people or so, myself, um, the chapter representative, uh, someone from the housing partnership, um, a city councilor, Alex Jarrett, um, did volunteer, and then a member of Valley CDC, um, who was the developer, um, and um, that would be the planning group, um, or the steering group, if you want to call it. Um, so I'm asking if there's any, so the the extent of the extra meetings, uh, Chapa said it would be three extra meetings really to plan, you know, do we want to do it remote? Some of the questions would be asking, you know, do we want the meetings to be remote? Where, you know, who will be reaching out to and kind of um, who's going to be facilitating um, that? Because um, Chappie's going to be there to kind of help and assist and help hone our kind of our, um, how we're framing everything. Um, but um, they're not going to be the ones kind of facilitating the bigger stakeholder group. So uh, I'm asking if anyone here in this group or those not um, here, um, if anyone wants to volunteer to be part of that core group of five people that will plan the meeting. Uh, and um, yeah. So Keith, Keith, I think let's step back for a moment. Um, I'm still, unclear and I want to leave room for everybody to, to ask questions um what 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 exactly we would be doing as that chapa group with the stakeholders I'm not totally clear on the steps here what we would be doing and what chapa would be sounds like chapa would be a um kind of like a coach in a way coaching us in a way I'm not totally clear on all of that yeah I mean that that about summarizes it um it's um there you know some of the technical training I've, I've read some of the documentation it's really a lot about you know how do we frame these discussions how do we think about um kind of talking about some of these issues around housing affordable housing um, you know, we have these stated values in the community, we have these different goals, but then kind of, you know, how do we address that through, you know, dialogue and, and kind of creating, um, you know, conversation around that. Um, so yeah, it is uh, kind of like coaching. Um, and really, I think the, the idea is to kind of um, use this project as a way to kind of hone our skills on developing um, those conversations and having um, dialogue about, you know, affordable housing, things that we're kind of um, focused on as the housing partnership. Um, beyond that, you know, what we're going to be doing, I know that the steering group, there's at least three meetings, it'll be online. Um, and then the kind of the broader stakeholder group, you know, we, according to the CHAPA um, application, uh, or what I put in the application, and then um, the kind of the technical guidelines for the program, there'll be at least one stakeholder group meeting, um, kind of huge universe of people. And then if there's, you know, kind of serious concerns or or there's a need for follow-up meeting we would do that um so if you're not on the um steering group or that planning group then you know you're looking at one additional meeting um or possibly two but uh i i don't know if we get to that second meeting Okay, first of all, thank you. So I just want to acknowledge that Ace came into the meeting. Hello, Ace, nice to see you. Does anybody else have questions?
No questions? So would, would the committee, the CHAPA committee, the steering committee, be then charged with um, holding the meeting for stakeholders and fielding some thoughts and fielding questions and answers? I, I think that's um, the gist of it. Um, you know, I think a lot of the um, leadership and the direction will be coming from me, myself and Valley CDC. Um, but we, you know, I think that's some of the questions that I had with Chapa is what does this look like if this is more community driven versus developer driven? And how do we kind of formulate conversations with, with that? Um, and, you know, I mentioned that and she's like, yeah, great. Well, let's talk about that when we kind of get to the, with that core group. Uh, Bev? Um, yeah, um, so I read the RFP when it first came out. And um, for those who didn't get to spend time with it, Chapa is uh, very committed to helping some who are otherwise still inclined and some who are not. And there are many of those in Massachusetts. Uh, get comfortable, right? Producing, encouraging the production of affordable housing in their communities. And to the extent that no matter where you live, <clears throat> there are always the people who are uh, not so comfortable. I think, you know, between the lines, the, the real issue here is to try and help um, cities and towns uh, be effective uh, conveners um, for discussions about affordable housing. And so, you know, if, if I'm right, and that's what they're really trying to get at, I guess my question is, um, how does this then become part of uh, learning for the city of Northampton about how to do this well? Mm -hmm. um, clearly through the core participating, right? But also to me that uh, there ought to be some process with learn and dialogue and how do we do this better next time? So that was part speech and part question. I think you just volunteered yourself, Bev. <laughs> Well, I, I honestly um, want to say that there are people on this in this um, meeting who have a lot more experience in Northampton than I. So, what I think is really important about our participation is that somebody who's into it, you know, I think we all would be, and who um, brings uh, perspective about what has or hasn't worked in the past that trying to, you know, get at this issue. Um, so I I stand back and see if there's somebody else who would be, you know, really interested in taking this on. That brings up another question, which is um, you indicated, I think you implied, Keith, that there's the steering committee, but then there, would there be an opportunity for other people from the housing partnership who are not on that committee to engage in, for example, the stakeholder meeting? Or would this really be that core steering committee that would get the CHAPA coaching and would then go forth? Oh, no, no, the, the housing partnership is definitely gonna be part of that larger uh, stakeholder meeting. Uh, I mean, you are the stake, you know, the, the stakeholders, um, um, and, you know, definitely want to use your brain trust to think about uh, more stakeholders. I sent the list of people that have already identified. Um, mm -hmm. And so if there's people on there that are not, or groups of people that are not on there, I would definitely like some input. Um, but yeah, I want the housing partnership to be embedded in this process. And um, to me, I don't know what the everything about the process, but that's it's exciting. You know, I'm just going to show up and like Bev says, get um, be comfortable being uncomfortable uh, because uh, people are going to have some questions for for us that we're going to have to like, wait, very good question. I would, you know, um, mm -hmm. why are we doing this, you know? So 
So I just want, oh, Richard. Quick note about that uh, stakeholders list. Uh, Broadbrook Coalition has always been active in uh, housing issues and they should get added to it. I'm sure it's, a, I'm sure they would have, would come when they find out about it. Will do. So just, just, just for your information, Migdalia, this is um, a project on Crafts Ave, right, right behind City Hall and the Unitarian Society, where um, I believe it's 16, right? Single room occupancy. I'm not single room occupancy, but one bedroom and studio apartments are gonna be built for currently homeless, un unhoused people. And this is our opportunity to learn and to be able to um, um, get a good message out to the community and the stakeholders about the importance of this project and these kinds of projects. Uh, just to ground you on that. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to volunteer to be on the steering committee. Just like you said, Bev, I'm not sure that I'm the best person to do that, but I certainly have the interest and I would just do the best I can unless somebody else here is like wanting to jump, to jump out and do it. It doesn't look like it. Are you all okay with that? Yes. Okay. Keith, I guess it will be me. Sounds good. Thank you. So I'll get separate communications from you. Looks like right. Bev has a hand. Oh, Bev, go ahead. I can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry about that. Try to be polite. Um, it strikes me that um, it would be a great representative for our but it also strikes me that um, we could maybe devote some important time to talking about what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, and our own ideas about what is working uh, in Northampton uh, to propel, you know, the energy of the people who live here to create, you know, more housing. So I, for one, would love to see us make this a um, pretty central agenda item as you go through it and ask you to share with us sort of your impressions right. of all that. I really think that this is a really exciting opportunity to make that a central agenda item. And that would be my intent, and I would hope the intent of, if it weren't me, somebody else who would volunteer. Yes, very inclusive process. Does anybody else have comments or questions about that? All right, let's move on. Um, small HUD, small area FMR. Keith, were you gonna talk about this? Yeah, I can start it, um, but really, I think it's really just kind of getting a temp temperature for the room and seeing, you know, kind of what's out there. Um, so we had talked about the moving, investigating, you know, moving towards the small area FMR, which, you know, currently uh, Northampton is part of the Springfield Metropolitan Metropolitan Statistical Area, which is the HUD verbal language, you know, for saying that we get our vouchers um, out of the Springfield area. And because Northampton is a higher cost of living area, that those vouchers um, for people in Northampton don't go as far as, say, someone in Springfield. Um, this was identified in the Fair Housing Assessment or the impediments to um, analysis of impediments to fair housing uh, that was released in 2019 or 2020. Um, so, um, you know, we, we did talk to um, the Northampton Housing Authority. They seemed hesitant. Um, they sounded like, you know, they did some investigation. Um, but I mean, the reason uh, I thought it'd be good reason just to see if there's interest is one you know, two of the things that we've been working on, um, 
uh, the legislation are kind of we're waiting for the legislation to go through, um, but also um, been part of a, a regional housing um, conversation and um, someone in another uh, Hampshire community town mentioned that um, the small area or the uh, I need to think of a better way to say that but moving towards a small area FMR might be beneficial for them um, but there there's a cost it's not just um, you know, hey, here's what we thought, HUD, please do this thing. Um, you really kind of need to do a housing study um, because there's a lot of, um, you really need a consultant to do it. Um, and so I, I thought maybe there was um, an opportunity to uh, work with this other community uh, and see if there can be a kind of a regional study we could do um, to see if uh, one, okay, what's the actual numbers um, if we move forward? Because uh, we have comparable, uh, it's Amherst, but it, we, have, you know, we have comparable kind of rents um, compared to say Springfield. Um, and just trying to see if there's, um, there's any um, will to do that. So, Richard? I can, Briefly go over some of the history to this, if it's useful for people. Yes, um, please. We, historically, the housing partnership has always been interested and usually advocated for getting out of the Springfield statistical area or having waiver that permits a higher voucher. The argument that we sometimes get for pushback is that if we pay a higher voucher amount, then the vouchers don't go as far and less people are served. So there is an underlying philosophical economic argument about how you wanna use your resources. My sense, and you know, I'd have to reevaluate my thinking has always been, we're not really serving people who wanna live in Northampton because it's just so hard with the vouchers. And so that there is, seems to me to be good reason to pursue whatever is the most efficacious way to get the voucher level up. That's sort of been the history and the dynamics that I can recall. Hannah? I just had a clarifying question. Richard, when you were, were you saying that like sort of the philosophical argument possibly against is that raising the amount of the individual vouchers means there's fewer vouchers to go around? Is that My understanding, and Gordon probably can speak to this better than I, I'll please do, Gordon. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Maybe it's best to give a, give some numbers, a hypothetical situation. So, so I first of all, you all need to know that when you get a voucher, you're you're, you're issued a voucher with with it comes with a bedroom size, and that and then you're told here is the fair market rent that you need to find an apartment that rents for at or below this amount, and that number is doesn't reflect the reality of the rental marketplace. In Western Mass, it's even pretty bad in Hamden County as well. Um, so, for ex so if you get so, and then your rent, your what you pay as a tenant is is whatever the rent is under that. As long as it doesn't exceed the fair market cap, is say you're the renting for a thousand dollars. That's the contract rent, and it, they do a calculation and they figure out well, your share of that thousand dollars is roughly going to be 30% of your income, monthly income. And let's just say it's $300 a month. So that means you, the tenant pays 300 and the housing authority is paying $700. Now, if we were to get that thousand dollars up to say $1,200 for whatever units, bedroom size that they have, it doesn't change what the tenant pays. It just means the housing authority has pays more rent. Um, so it, the fair market rent actually has a way of limiting the costs of the housing. They only get, it's not so much that they get vouchers, they get, they get a, uh, they get assigned a, a budget of how much they have. And out of that, they get to issue vouchers. So if you're in, if you are paying more per tenant for a voucher, it means you're going to have less money around. You're going to have, you're not going to be able to have as many vouchers. 
unless you increase the overall funding on top of that. So that's why whenever we raise this with the house in Northampton, they're always a little bit hesitant because it doesn't really, they've got to deal with the, the, the tension between more vouchers or le, uh, serving more, you know, it's that tension between, you know, more vouchers or less, you know, serving fewer people with greater assistance or less assistance, but serving more people. Other thoughts before I ramble on for a minute? Um, so. Looks like Bev has a hand. Oh, Bev, go ahead. Sorry. I just mm -hmm. make sure I understand the combination of what um, Jordan and Richard said. So the housing authority, if it gets this notion because of the issue of uh, I'm losing you. Yeah, it's Sorry. been hard to hear you. Yeah, it's been hard. You you've been breaking up when you when you talk. Yeah, I'm not on both, and it, my internet may not be great, so I'm happy to shut off if that's the case. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to understand housing authorities issue is what you just described. Do they have any stats on how many people who want to live in Northampton can't? Does the FMR doesn't support the housing cost? We've, we've gotten data from them that talks about what, what we're concerned about is the number of people who uh, end up never using the voucher once they've been issued it because they could not find an apartment. And, and they don't have to live in Northampton when you get a voucher. You can go to Springfield with your Northampton voucher. And how many of them struggle with, how many of them, what they, what they call is their return rate. And there are tenants that lose their voucher because they can't lease up within the 60 day period that they're given. I say 60 days, but you can always ask for extension, but, the, but, the, but they issue you a voucher and say, you have 60 days to give us the name of a landlord that's willing to rent to you. Um, and then they have to go through an approval process. Um, and uh, I see it all the time in my work that tenants, um, and they don't have a right to appeal, by the way, you, uh, it's just, you just lose it. Um, so it's unlike being terminated when you did something wrong, like you broke your lease, you get a hearing. But when you, when, when you are a participant, in, uh, when you're an applicant getting a new voucher, you lose it. And so people do lose those vouchers, and it's not just unique to Northampton. Um, I don't know how many people want to stay in Northampton with those vouchers, but they do manage, many of the vouchers they're managing are outside of Northampton. So mm -hmm. people are taking Northampton vouchers that were property of Northampton, I shouldn't say property, but they were issued by Northampton and they're living in Holyoke and Springfield with those vouchers. Mm -hmm. So Keith, just to, just to clarify, you're asking if somebody's interested in joining with somebody from Amherst, right? From the uh, Amherst. I don't know if we need to, I just, I guess for the housing partnership overall, is there kind of interest in investigating this again? Um, it, it seems, uh, I, I did some more kind of research into it and it, you know, it seems like they, I think the approval process I don't know if it requires a study, um, but definitely a study would help kind of make a case um, and get some real numbers behind it. And if it was a coalition of a few different towns, um, there might be, uh, because, you know, in conversations, um, you know, throughout, um, you know, the Western Mass Network and homelessness and this other regional um, thing is, you know, housing is a regional issue, you know, like vouchers, issued in Northampton or used in Holyoke. We see the homeless shelter, uh, people move between the shelters, um, you know, and the providers, you know, Valley CDC works in Amherst and Hadley and in uh, Northampton. So um, there might be, um, I mean, I don't know what the next steps are. I think the next, w one of the things would be getting in conversation with these other towns and saying if that's something they wanna do. Richard? Uh, I fully support your networking and taking this as far along as you can to provide information about what might be involved. And when it comes to what kind of resources we dedicate or what information about the downside, I assume that's a part of it, but I don't think there's any downside to making this decision with more information. And I would support your exploring it on behalf of the partnership. And I would 
I don't think you need a motion, but if you need one, I'd be happy to make it. Gordon? Yeah, I, I, we met, it's going back when Jim was still with us, but we had a mm -hmm. meeting with uh, McGovern and he was very interested in working on this issue with us, trying to figure out what he could do. So I just want to add that in that he may be, he may be an asset that we could use for this as well, because ultimately we're trying to convince an administrative agency to, to decouple Hampshire County from Hamden County. And they need to be convinced that their numbers are wrong. And that's what the study is about. And they're not gonna do the work. They want someone else to convince them. And he might be able to be, be a liaison for pushing that through. And I would expect Amherst and East Hampton, to the extent we've had conversations with them about that, they're all, they all have the same issues. Mm -hmm. So Keith, is this something that you would do or are you asking if somebody on the partnership would like to volunteer? Um, just, I, th I think just using guys as the brain trust, I've you know started to do some initial kind of uh, investigation, um, but um, you know, knowing that you guys seem um, enthusiastic, then I'll be uh, trying to, bring more things to you and i think there might be a conversation with the amherst affordable housing trust if you know if there's pushback from you know different town managers or something uh maybe they can have a conversation with them why this is important i don't know how integrated um that some of the um looks like gwen's joining us um i don't know how integrated um some of the you know, the municipal leadership is with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and the issues that they're working on. Um, so it might be an opportunity for education uh, up from our colleagues uh, in the other trust funds. Okay, well, we'd be very interested in hearing what... Uh, go on, I'm sorry, Anything? Bev has a hand. Bev? Uh, I just want to echo. Uh, I think it's really important that we get uh, involved in this. I want to... Um, point out a couple of other things that come to my mind, one of which is that there are two kinds of vouchers. One is a traveling voucher, which is, or tenant-based voucher that an individual has to go shopping for housing. And the other is a project-based voucher, which is tied to a development that people would then live in and get the benefit of the rent subsidy while they're living there. And if the... FMR is out of whack with the cost of building and operating in a community, um, it makes it that much harder, whether it's Valley CDC or somebody else, to use those vouchers to build something. And the other thing is, I'm on another board and it's a nonprofit in Springfield, and I hear over and over again that the current and for many years mayor of that city uh, is really hard on uh, affordable housing because it is his view that Springfield does an unfair share of housing people who need it. I worked in Holyoke too, and I've heard that same tale. Maybe it's true, but as you were saying, you know, to the extent that we believe that uh, creating places for people to live and creating choice about where you live is a regional um issue then for places like Northampton and Amherst to get behind uh, a more regional approach is really powerful not even beyond our borders right um even in terms of the way that people in Springfield and Holyoke feel about this so uh, yeah obviously very uh supportive of this thank you yeah I don't I'm not so sure the FMR uh, analysis applies to project based. It's it's. I think it's uniquely a, a um, mobile voucher issue. I mean, I'm, and there's so many ways in which project based these these developers get get reimbursed or, or, or are able to afford to provide affordable housing. It's um, uh, but it's the FM the FMR is applied to, to to the choice the housing choice vouchers, which are formally known. Well, well, it's been a little bit of time since I did this, but. Um, it creates a benchmark against yeah. which exception rents, right, uh, get looked at. Right. And if your exception is way above uh, the FMR, then it becomes a different conversation, in my experience. 
Okay. I do want to acknowledge that Gwen has joined us. Hi, Gwen. You're coming in on the tail end of this conversation around um, small area fair market rent for Section 8, et cetera. Yes. So, Hello. Hi. I'm sorry, I'm so late. I, I got caught up in a in a um a collaborative meeting, so I I couldn't leave and get here on time, but I'm here now. And I'm What's hearing that? the conversation. Um I want to just kind of acknowledge that any kind of federal housing or federal vouchers um, disallows college students. So federal housing is great. Federal vouchers are great. But, um, you know, say it's a, a single mom who's, whose kids are growing up and they're ready to make the transition, they would lose their housing if they went to school. And so that really, um, kind of keeps people in one place and I wonder if there could be some change somehow like fermenting some kind of change in that it's not like that with state but it is like that with federal sorry so um I'm a little out of breath so I'm just gonna shush and thank you thanks thanks Gwen thank you so much for being here and rushing over all right, any other comments, questions about this? It looks like we'll be hearing more from Keith, regular updates. We'll look forward to that, right? Okay, nobody's hand is up that I don't see. All right, um, okay, let's move on. So item number six, updates on legislation. I also realized uh, we probably should have an update on the um, Municipal Housing Trust Fund Subcommittee because I think you guys met yesterday. Um, so we'll do that right after updates on legislation. I'll start. Um, update on the broker uh, on the, um, you know, broker fees not being um, assumed by renters. That legislation has died, basically. Um, I never got a response back from Lindsay Sabadoza's office. So I actually just went online today to look up a little bit about the process and my understanding, which is written right there in bill 4886 or whatever it was, was that last July, it, um, it made it through 25% of the process. Then it died in committee. And then on January 3rd, when everybody was sworn in and the agenda was set, it said that it was not taken up again. Ace. Uh, so I'm I'm quickly looking this up, but my understanding was that it it that's that's not true. It has been reissued okay. for the new session. Um, oh. and I'm I'm seeing if I can refine that, but uh, uh, that's I do not think that is true. Okay, well that's what it said on the legislative legal whatever. So anyway, I'm glad you're here to. I have a to question. Give some hope. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if Ace, when you look that up, if you see that there are any near coming or any coming legislation, legislative sessions that we could go to and um, provide testimony, we could do that. Uh, ha happy to let you know. I know that historically uh, they have contacted me. Uh, I will. I will check that. Though. Thanks, Gordon. Gwen, thank you for that reminder. There's something I, I should share, but I don't need to share it now. I can do it as other business. It's a very, very important piece of legislation that's coming up, Chapter 257, which we need to renew, which has to do with stalling evictions for people who have been applying for RAFT assistance. It's expiring at March 31st. Can we can we just go to that and then we'll combine these two? Gordon, can you say more yeah, about Well, that? I think people are familiar that there is this program called RAP that's been around for many, many years, but it got super, super funded um, by federal money during COVID. And uh, basically it, it's, it's a rental arrearage that will help people pay off arrears if they've suffered a financial hardship. And it was a great, great asset to preventing evictions during COVID. Um, they've changed their, the funding mechanism a little bit, but right now you, you can get up to $10,000 in any 12 month period to help you pay off your arrears and avoid eviction. Um, and, but the, what the, the, so the, it's not that the money's going away, but there is a piece of legend. There was a, a law that was passed during COVID affectionately referred to as chapter 257. That's what everyone refers to it as. That says that if a tenant 
uh, appears in court and represents to the, to the court that they're in the process of seeking those funds, there's an immediate continuing, there's a, the case can freezes and until that, and so that that process can play out. So it's, it's, so it means that the eviction can't proceed to judgment. It can't proceed if, if it's already a judgment, it can't proceed to execution. These are the steps in an eviction until there's been a disposition on the application. And the whole point of it is to allow these funds to be utilized to, to save people's tenancies where otherwise they would be evicted for non-payment of rent. And so that's the, the legislation is, is sunsets March 31st and there's a, is an effort right now to, um, to extend it or make it permanent. Um, and how can we best participate in that? Uh, I can send along information. I, I get emails about this on my list serves all the time. I don't know, I, Keith, you haven't seen anything come through your list? Cause this is, this is like a statewide thing going on. This is the first time I've You know, know, know about chapter 257. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass something along to Keith after the meeting. Okay. Keith. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, I, I actually cannot advocate for it because where I work, we are restricted from commenting on legislation as a legal aid. Believe it or not, legal aid oh, lawyers cannot, cannot comment on legislation. We cannot oh, advocate for the, you, don't tell anybody I told you this. <laughs> I'm not wearing my LSC. I'm not wearing my legal aid. Okay, well, thank you, Gordon, for that, for that secret. Hannah, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask the same question about, you know, where could we get more information? Um, I'm also wondering, though, is it is it too soon to return um, to the uh, broker fee legislation? No, let's go back. Go ahead. Um, yeah. uh, oh, sorry, uh, Ace. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that I have just posted a link in chat to uh, the reissue for uh, this bill for the current session. Um, as you can see from the number 54, uh, it is uh, um, like it, it it got reissued and and fairly early on, um, and uh, it's you know it it does exist uh, and it is currently active for this session. Um, I am also noting there's not currently any other things coming up that I can find, um, but it appears that Brockton has issued a, a similar home rule petition. Uh, that is wow. currently in session as well. Ace, um, can you can you just briefly tell us, send us some information about how you looked this up so quickly and more accurately than I was able to? Um, so I had the old link for the MA legislature bill, um, and I had been uh, for uh, you know an unrelated to housing partnership needs looking this up. Uh, and basically saw in the sidebar on the site, it links um, related bills. Uh, and so it will, it will list similar bills to the side there. And I saw that uh, the, the current bill for this year was this one um, and was able to find it that way. Um, I, I was also able to find it uh, by searching the site uh, for, you know, um, basically uh, prohibit landlords and brokers uh, from issuing okay. fees. Good news. You'll keep us updated with the latest, right? Yes. Okay. Hannah. Uh, yeah, just, just before we move on from that, uh, first, thanks, Ace, for finding that updated link. Um, yeah. I feel like, you know, when I see how confusing it is and kind of how difficult, like, Carmen, you as the chair, like it wasn't clear that this legislation wasn't dead in the water. It mm -hmm. it makes me feel like I I hope there's more that we can be doing just to nudge on this. I don't know if that's an email to Lindsay Sabadosa. I mean, I feel like a regular ping is a, a realistic form of activism. Um, and when I think about the fact that like there's so many people who want this and look to the housing partnership for updates, like if if we don't know what's happening, um, I'm just I'm wondering if that's something that we could talk about or agree to, like sending a just like sending an email to Lindsay Lindsay Sabadosa every X number of months to say what's the update, um, and it, at least it's just like in front of somebody. Um, so I, I'm just curious what people think about that and if that seems appropriate. I think it's a really good idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, and when we get a chance, I do have a couple of notices, just announcements. 
Um, <clears throat> if we do that, do you think that, I mean, I guess the more people, the more pings, the better, right? So we can remind the housing partnership, this is something you can do for this particular legislative um, bill that's going through. And then everybody who wants to join in can do a ping, right? Would okay. people be okay if I, if like I acted as point person or something to, to be sending that message? I don't. Yes. Okay, that cool. would be so great. I will that ping them. Great. great. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So can we move on to other legislative um, updates? I'm going to yes. move on to the municipal housing trust in a minute, but Ace, do you have another um, legislative update? Um, so, uh, I, I, I have an update for the, um, uh, transfer fee, uh, which, um, yeah. does oddly enough tie into the, um, trust fund. <laughs> um, so I, uh, was able to meet with, uh, counselors Jarrett and Maori, uh, in addition to, um, meeting with, uh, I am blanking on her name right now, uh, but Mish. there's Carolyn Mish. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was able to meet with them last week uh, and to talk about the future of the transfer fee. I was able to get the uh, mayor's office, the um, numbers documents that I shared with you to uh, help um, basically find out what it would take to get the governor or not the governor, the mayor on board with uh, this fee in order to move forward. Um, one of the topics that was brought up was the fact that the current bills moving forward in the legislature all list the transfer fee as needing to go to a housing trust specifically. Um, and I checked in again to ask on, you know, why there was this resistance to the housing trust. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Carolyn Mitch expressed, um, you know, uh, interest in having a specific and targeting targeted housing trust um, and specifically the areas of needs that she sees are for uh, things that are between 80 and 150 percent of area median income. Um, so housing that is not for the most at needs groups, like for people 80 percent below, there's a lot of programs currently active, currently working on that. Um, and you know that's where a lot of CPA money goes. That's there's there's much more interest and action in that area. But where she sees the greater need is for 80 to 150 uh, percent people who are not as critically at need, but who are missing that cutoff for capital A affordable housing. Um, this is related to a concept of uh, workforce housing, which um, is mm -hmm. a thing that is apparently. Uh, municipally decided of what that means. The intent is, you know, for basically working class people, um, you know, people of say median income, uh, housing for those folks who are getting priced out of places like Northampton. The analogy used was that, you know, on the average, you know, government workers' salary, on the average, say, teachers' salary, uh, teachers in Northampton can't afford to live in Northampton, and that's bad. Um, so uh, in, in her view, one of the things to get her office on board with um, the transfer fee would be, you know, related to this concept of workforce housing and getting the, the trust to, uh, you know, focus its goals on something like that was, was a, a suggestion and idea that she floated, which I think dovetails with some of the things that have been um, brought back from, from the subcommittee. Um, regarding the transfer fee itself, um, that's so still in kind of a wait and see business. Um, I am unsure how much uh, I, I'm I am unsure of next steps, but I know that we have brought it to the mayor's office and that you know they're they're looking more at it. Um, Gwen, you have a question. Yes. One of the things that affects area median income, believe it or not, is retirement income. And it's pretty high. So are they discerning, are they, is, are they separating out 
what work actual worker income is versus retirement income? Do you know or I I don't know. Um, what okay. one of one of the one of the questions brought up was you know what those numbers actually are. Um, and uh, Carolyn Mish didn't have them on hand. Um, my understanding is she's going to be getting back to us. Uh, that hasn't happened, but it's only been five days. Okay, thank you. Ace, thank you so much for continuing to work on this. Um, this is good, good information to bring back to the committee. Does any, so we should move on to the Municipal Housing Trust Fund update, but does anybody have a question or comment about what Ace said um, before we move on to specifically to the Housing Trust Fund, Edgar? Uh, yeah, I just, I just want to echo the same sentiment. Definitely, thank you so much, uh, Ace, uh, for all the legwork and all the uh, effort that you put into this. Um, and I am so happy to hear actually uh, what uh, Carolyn mentioned um, because we actually uh, touched up on that in our meeting yesterday because um, it is, uh, uh, even with as much resources as we have for low-income folks, uh, it's hard for low-income folks to find housing here in Northampton, but it's definitely even harder for uh, folks of, of medium income. Um, and uh, it's just something that I, I, I've been thinking about for years. And and, and it's uh, one of the things that um, that we talked about yesterday in terms of like some, some of the things, some of the ways in which the housing trust uh, fund uh, could help in terms of uh, gap funding, right? And so um, I'll, I'll let Hannah um, uh, talk a little bit more um, about uh, what we discussed. And, uh, and again, thank you, Hannah, so much for taking such great notes. I really appreciate it. Uh, Bev, the hands. Oh, Bev, you have a hand up and then Hannah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I've been on the CPC for a very brief period of time, so I can't talk about trend lines. What I can say is since this conversation has been going on, what I've heard from people uh, in staff positions at the city and elsewhere is that we don't need additional funding because the CPA money covers it plus CDBG and whatever else. And Carmen um, uh, and I have talked about this a couple of times. It's a little bit hard to understand what is enough because demand can be defined by um, the receptivity of the funder or the perception of people who want to build housing that a place is relatively difficult to work in. And so one of the things that I've been curious about, and maybe we could devote, you know, half a meeting so I could hear from all of you who have way more experience in Northampton, is um, <clears throat> is CPA money enough because it's become defined in a way that enough is enough? I mean, I as long as I've been on, there hasn't been a proposal. Well, one, uh, we won't get in the weeds from other than Valley CDC. I know that's the local homegrown darling, but there's a lot of developers out there. And um, I just, I, I wonder if there's a way for us collectively to reality test that theory. And, you know, we all know that NIMBY is part of the problem. We all know that uh, lack of buildable sites is part of the problem. Maybe zoning is part of the problem. Um, who knows what's creating, you know, kind of a a, 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 a a limitation on the ability to create more affordable. But I just, I, I don't know how to have the conversation without exploring that topic. And maybe we're not the group to explore it, but it feels like somebody should, should be. The other thing I want to say is that in my um, experience, the absolute best housing new developed rental housing is mixed income. And a quality mixed income community, you know, you don't want to get into percentages, 
but transcends what we're talking about here from very low income to moderate income to market income, uh, where people are actually, guess what, living together. And the uh, economics of mixed income are very um, uh, important, right? Because in theory, the market rate units pay for themselves and the affordable units are paid for by vouchers or whatever. And people in the middle do, as we're saying here, need um, a subsidy unto themselves. And those subsidies are sometimes hard to come by. So I, I, I would just encourage us to not think about, okay, we're gonna get behind workforce housing because it doesn't have to be, um, I mean, it, it can be part of a larger uh, strategy for inclusion and great um, neighborhoods. So again, okay. sorry for going on and on, but. Um, Thank you, Beth. So I think Hannah, we're gonna turn to you, right? For um, further explanation about for the Housing Trust Fund. Yeah, something. I just want to make sure Gwen also had a hand. Gwen, is there something that you wanted okay. to say first? Okay, oh. and I also just want to say, Gwen, before you say something, I want to say, because I'm looking at this on my iPad, the people in the top row, your top half of your picture is cut off. So that's why I'm not seeing some hands. Anyway, Gwen, go ahead. Um, I just want to respond to Bev. And I agree that mixed mixed housing is the best. It, it also, you know, um, you know, if we if we keep speaking about like low income or you know just only that, you know, we increase the likelihood of segregation, and so we don't want that. We want to have mixed income and you know have the benefits of you know that sort of back and forth between people of different classes and colors and things like that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Gwen. Hannah. Uh, yeah, so uh, Edgardo and Gwen and I met yesterday. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in any of this, so I encourage them to chime in at any point. But we met to talk about the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And um, what I was doing over the past month was researching other trust funds that exist in Massachusetts, seeing where they get their funding from and also the type of projects they're funding. Um, I won't go too deep into it right now because one thing that we wanna do is maybe give like a presentation in April with some of what we've learned. But I mean, it seems like all of these places, um, Medfield was one that we looked at, Somerville was another one, Amherst, and, and all of these places are working with the CPA um, for funding, but like, like it's in addition to the CPA. So we just felt more convinced than ever that this is something that is, wouldn't just be useful, but is needed. Uh, I mean, even, even just the name itself, like affordable housing trust fund is something like the name says what it does. And it's something that people can get excited about. Um, we had all watched a little bit of uh, the Amherst, like Amherst recorded meetings, and they were just saying that since starting up the fund, like people are just excited about it. And, and the fact that they know it exists, they're they're like spreading the word and coming to the, the housing trust fund with questions and requests. So uh, we, yeah, we just felt like, and, and also, I mean, it, uh, like Bev, what you said, and Gwen, what you said, it all synthesizes really well because the affordable housing trust fund like it the scope of what they can do like even legally just laid out like there's there's sort of a scope of what they can do in Massachusetts like here's the types of projects they normally fund and it would cover all of this so I mean it can cover education it can cover running workshops it can cover um new housing or repurposing housing um so we were really excited about it uh I hope that like maybe we can get it on the agenda for April. Um, trying to mm -hmm. think if there's anything else, but we were just we were all thumbs up. So that's what I'll say about it for now. And if anybody has any questions, I mean, first of all, we'd love to hear a more more about it in April when you guys are ready to present. And again, my my hat is off to you. You know, I know that back in January I had said, well all right, well, we're not gonna do this. For some reason, I think that reason has to do with the fact that I'm like really a big picture person and drilling down into 
some of the details is just, it's just not my greatest skill. So again, I want to thank the three of you so much for doing this. I think it's really important. Does anybody else have any comments? Anybody who I can see or who I can't see, feel free to speak up. Richard? Yeah, I think one of the reasons why um, this has been challenging is because the city has been consistently against this, probably mm -hmm. puts Keith in an awkward position. And I think we all believe in it firmly. And I think that there are things like legislation that funds money into this. It's something that opens great possibilities. And we're going to have to push this stone ourselves. We can't expect the city to do it. But you know, we we can have a different perspective than the municipal government. They're worried about the burden. We're, we're worried about the opportunities. Thanks, Richard. All right. Well, you'll definitely be on the agenda next time. Hannah? Um, I don't know. I didn't need to add this last minute, but um, just one, one thing is also um, you know, Medfield, as an example, their their municipal housing trust fund was started with a private bond. So, you know, even though they they said they don't want to rely on private funding in the future moving forward, it just it seems like there's a lot of options for funding for getting something like this started. So um, that's that's all I'll say about it. Great. Any I, other I, yep. Sorry, it's Gwen. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Gwen. I, I just okay, cannot sorry. see her. Go ahead. Um, so another thing we talked about is, is that these trust funds can gain interest. Um, so if the money, you know, if there's an amount of money in there, they can, it can always be gaining interest. And so that's an advantage, I would think. Um, and, you know, we'll give more details when we do our presentation. Great. Thanks. Ed Edgar? Yeah, uh, yeah. I just want to mention one more of the benefits, mm -hmm. um, which is which is pretty obvious. But um, what one of the ones that I'm more uh, one of the benefits that I'm more excited about is the fact that um, th it, it, this fund wouldn't be bound by any predetermined funding cycles. You know, like the CPA. I think the, their funding cycles are maybe twice a year or three times a year. I forget. But this, you know, it, this is this is something that that you know could provide sort of um, you know uh, uh, quicker uh, funding or emergency funding um, or funding that's not anticipated. So that's that's kind of for, for me that's 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 a no brainer there. Yeah, very positive. All right, thank you. Any other legislative updates? I think I think we've covered them all at this point, right? Nobody's waiting in the wings here. All right, um, so let's move on. If there's any other business not anticipated, for those of you who came in a little late, I mentioned that Sarah has resigned from the committee, Sarah Howard. So we're down to eight people. Um, so hopefully, I know there's at least one applicant. She was here tonight listening in. Um, and I don't know what the other recruitment um, efforts have been, but... Um, yeah, hopefully we'll get we'll get some other good people, I'm sure. All right. Anything else? Business not anticipated? Thank you so much for coming to this meeting. It's such a pleasure to hear all of you. And um, yeah, I really mean that. Is there a motion to end the meeting? Motion to adjourn. A second. second. All right, Third. everybody. That's it.